Hello, I'm Bob the Booker and welcome to my channel. Um, today I'm going to be talking about a book that, um, <laughs> kills the breeze, a book, wow, where does he get these ideas? Um, so I'm going to be talking about a book that um, has recently been released um, to some fanfare because it is by Salman Rushdie. Um, and Salman Rushdie is a very well respected author, very prolific in many ways, um, has done incredibly well um, in terms of prizes and in terms of recognition. Um, but also this book comes at an interesting time, given everything. It's his first book since uh, his attack, uh, the attack that happened to him uh, sort of towards the end of last year, um, where he was attacked at a, an author event. Um, and there's a whole lot more backstory to, to all of that, but essentially a large part of it is to do with uh, sort of historically from when he wrote um, the Satanic Verses years and years ago. Um, and there was a whole controversy around that. I, I'm not going to go into all of the details here because it's really actually quite a long story. Um, but this is his first book since, and so obviously there are going to be more eyes on it than probably before. Um, and also relevantly to this channel, I also think it probably has a decent shout at the Booker later this year. Um, but all that to be said, um, I'm going to be talking just a bit about this book. I just want to say right from the beginning, um, I there will be parts of this where I will be giving spoilers, but those are going to be announced first. So this first wedge, I guess, of the video is going to be me talking in a relatively spoiler free way, you know, no spoilers beyond really my thoughts overall on the book and things that you could glean from the back um, cover from the, the sort of synopsis on the back. Um, and then I will let you know when I'm about to go into spoiler territory. So please, if you've not read it yet, feel free to click off at that part. Um, but let's get talking a bit about this book. So this book hinges on telling the story, a sort of myth and sort of founding story of a town um, in what's now India um, from the 14th century, um, which at the time, or at least in this book, is called Bisnaga, which is um, f which comes from a Portuguese man not being able to say the town's full name. And so this whole book is really concerned with this idea of myths and the, the stories we tell ourselves around culture, around what makes a place. Um, and so, so much of the story is then about this. It, it sort of is around this, this really strong idea of what stories do we tell ourselves when we create our sort of national myths um, and our national tales. So, you know, thinking of my home country of the UK, we have many stories that we tell ourselves about what the founding of the UK um, or England or various other towns or whatever were all about. And so much of that is sort of, so, you know, some of those are based in historical fact. Some of those are taking parts of historical fact and kind of building a slightly more... Um, elaborated story from that and some of them are just these sort of founding myths right so we've got um all of these things that get combined into one um and someone is screaming outside i hope they're okay i think we're fine um and uh so we this book is then all about these myths that that um go into the founding of this story so we start with um uh, this a woman at the heart of it whose name i literally have just forgotten again Oh, da, 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 da. Uh, Pampa Campana, um, who is uh, this sort of mystical, magical being. And early on, she witnesses um, the death of her mother. Um, I, I, this isn't a spoiler. This happens very, very early on. We're talking the first, pa first few pages. Um, and that whole story really shapes her as well. It sort of outlines to her a sense of injustice, potentially, particularly around the way the various ways that men and women are treated and the the various roles that people are expected to play um it reinforces some of these founding myths as well around oh you do these things to make the ruler happy or you do these things to contribute to a better society or, or what have you and this idea that tradition is there and it's you know you just have to follow it and it's it's there to be a, you know adhered to and so the book starts to build from that central idea that founding myths and founding tales are critical to our understanding of ourselves, but also to this idea of what it is to be a nation. And the idea of a nation is a very strange thing in many ways. Um, many nations have sort of risen out of previous conflicts or what have you, and the, then sort of myths need to be retold around those to kind of reestablish who are we, what what does it mean to be from this place and not this place? Um, and so 
it starts with these really interesting kind of fabulous kind of tales. And right from the beginning, this book kind of assumes this additional narrative voice, which is something that I normally really enjoy in Salman Rushdie books. Occasionally I have been frustrated by it, but actually I think it works really well here, which is this this slightly removed voice that is almost somebody telling you the story. And I know that sounds obvious about having a narrative, a narrator in that sense, but I think something I've noticed with Salman Rushdie is it very much feels like you are sat down um, under a tree being told a story um, of someone saying, well, you know, in the first instance, this thing happened and you wouldn't quite believe it, but then this thing happened. And there's this sort of extra commentary going on throughout the book, um, which I found really engaging and interesting uh, the whole way through, actually. I thought that voice would grate on me um, as it went on, as it has with some other Salman Rushdie books for me before. Um, but I actually really enjoyed that aspect of it, that it did feel like in engaging with the idea of myth and myth-making, it is also being told as a fairy tale, even though some of the incidents that we then start talking about are very real and um, are also based sometimes in historical incidents as well. So although we've got this kind of fabulous, magical element at the heart of it, where we've got... Um, We've got this sort of magical woman who we're told right from the beginning lives until she's around 240 years old. Um, we've got this kind of magical realist sort of fabulous element to everything. Um, but we've also got these very real battles happening. And so we get this really sort of interesting dichotomy right from the beginning of what does it mean to tell a real story? What does it mean... Um, if some of the tales we tell ourselves about history are slightly elaborated and kind of made a little bit more magical or a bit more um, exciting to the audience to make them also feel that there's something special about them, right? You know, the the whole thing of, you know, our people have this magical power. Um, and so right from the beginning, it engages with this in what I think is then a really clever, interesting way. And this continues throughout the book. We then get stories of battles and of war, and these magic powers occasionally come in, um, but they're, they're put right alongside some very, very real life thing. This is not a sort of a world of wizards and goblins and, you know, all of these magical elements. This is something of this, this one sort of magical character. There are a few things that are a bit kind of fairy tale like and then everything else feels very very real um and we get this this story of how the kingdom is shaped by who is married to who and who has children who are then put in line for the throne and all of the kind of court drama that you kind of typically expect for a book um, or a story that is around um, the royal court and, and what have you. Um, all of which starts to lead towards the modern day. And actually, this is where I thought Rushdie was going to sort of pull a quick one at the end and really link us back to some of the stories of modern day India um, with... Uh, you know, current uh, current politicians or what have you. And he doesn't directly, but part of me can't help but feel that there is something implicit in this book, that um, some of the myth-making in this book, some of the, the storytelling that we tell ourselves in the formation of a country, some of that is around um, what does modern-day India look like in terms of those stories? Because actually, are we looking back at things that um, we're told our tradition and therefore must be kept even if they're not serving people um a big example of that potentially in this book is right from the beginning i you know i mentioned the the death of um of this woman's mother and actually the death comes from the the sort of tradition practiced in some parts of india but i think it's worth saying it's not all of india as far as i'm aware um of uh the the widows of um of, of sort of their dead husbands um, self-immolating themselves, self, you know, be, setting themselves on fire um, as part of a, a process of sort of ending a certain thing and a sort of tradition of, um, of, of kind of that being the honourable way to sort of end something. You know, your husband has died and you die with them in some form. Um, and that comes up through the book of sort of Rushdie sort of questioning whether that's a thing that is to be continued um, and kept on. It's difficult to go into much more of this book without going into some spoilers. So I'm going to drop the spoiler curtain shortly. Um, but just to quickly say before I do that, I think this book is is really fascinating. Is I really enjoyed it. I think I maybe preferred some of his other books, generally speaking, but there was still a lot about this that I loved. I, I really liked the richness and playfulness of the storytelling. I really liked the, the sort of dark humour and sort of subtleties 
hiding behind some of the words. I think Rushdie's really great at that, of of just sort of hiding in the, sort of waiting in the wings to sort of drop a little comment in that's very funny and then drop back out. Um, and the book is full of those. But I think, um, and I, I think it's really well worth your time. I think it's a, a really fascinating book. It's around sort of 330 pages or so, so not radically long, um, but I still think it's well worth checking out. Anyway, I'm going to drop the spoiler curtain. Feel free to drop off now if you have not yet read the book and plan to, um, and we'll go from there. So with spoilers in effect, um, it's worth noting that basically next, what, what the book starts moving into, as I sort of hinted at, is the, this idea of the, the kingdom being challenged in terms of who takes power and not. And a big kind of core relationship that sort of starts off the book is um, this protagonist, whose name, again, I've forgotten. Oh, my gosh, Bob, um, who is uh, Pampa Campana. And um, she, um, there's a sort of thing of her potentially having committed adultery or at least in the sort of framework of the book at first you know there's a portuguese explorer who's there and he um seems to be the father of these three children who are then never seen again uh partly because they look a lot like him <laughs> um and she sort of floats in this really interesting place in the book because she is an incredibly powerful woman um, not only in terms of her confidence and her poise and her royal position, but also she's magic. <laughs> so, and she lives to, to 240. And so the book starts then engaging with these idea, ideas of her watching history go by. You know, her being that old means that she sees various kingdoms come and go in India. And therefore she sees that history repeats itself. And again, this is where I feel like Rushdie's maybe making more of a political point. I, I don't want to put words in his mouth there, but I feel like there is something then being said about the way that power is seized or held or what have you, um, and what that might then mean for India's current political situation or, or the political situation of the last 50, 60, 70 years, what have you. Um, and so this character Pampa, she then sort of flows through this book of sort of watching history go by and she has to intervene at various points to try and shut down some battles or to try and take power. All the while, people around are creating new stories and destroying old stories and this cycle just keeps continuing of what things carry over from tradition and what things do not. Um, and I will say sort of occasionally the sort of battle scenes are not always my most favourite thing in um, in books. Um, however, I think actually these were quite light touch compared to some I've read before where I think Rushdie sort of does a bit of the battle stuff and kind of acknowledges that he probably has to give some detail, but it's some, something broader is happening. There's a more interesting point that he's trying to get to. Um, and so we lead increasingly towards the end of this book and this idea of well, where does this end? Because this story is kind of ongoing. But is this just going to be the end of Pampa? The end of her 240 years? Is it going to be the end of this city, this town? How do you kind of keep preserving these things? And she acts as this observer through history, but obviously her time must end. We're told right at the beginning, this sort of, she has a limited lifespan. She knows almost from the beginning how long she's going to live. Um, and so within all of that, we, we get this sort of really quite rich story. There's so much more to really go into in some ways, but I think without going into all of the various plot points of this book, it's going to be quite tricky. But I think overall, I just really enjoyed how this book engages with these ideas of what it means to tell a story, both about yourself and about where you're from, but also as a nation. How does a nation follow the same story? I mean, in some ways, kind of similar to maybe something like Life of Pi by Jan Martel, it starts questioning the idea of what it means to actually tell a story. Who's got it right? Who is telling it incorrectly? You know, this whole idea as well that history is told by victors. And so who is actually telling this story of India? Is it people who succeeded and won various battles? Is it people who lost? Is it, the, is it sort of the subjective view of history, if that's ever possible? All of these various things come into it. Um, and so for me, this was a good, at least solid four out of five. I think kind of probably leaning towards the higher end of that. Um, I'm not quite sure if I loved it enough to really go for a five star. But I also do think it's a book that on multiple readings will get a little bit more. There'll be a little bit more to find, I think, in it. And that's what also makes me think that this book may have a good shot with a fair few prizes this year. Not only because for something like The Booker, for example, uh, Salman Rushdie is guaranteed to have his book submitted as a former winner, um, but also... Um, 
uh, it's a book that once you read it, uh, you know, if you make a long list, for example, for the booker, you then have to reread the book to then choose the shortlist. And I think actually it's a book that stands up well, I'd assume, to rereading. Um, anyway, I've been by the booker here, rambling on about this book. Um, I hope you um, enjoy it if you do pick it up um, and or have already read it. Um, and I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments. Please also try and keep those comments spoiler free if you can. Um, take care and speak to you all soon. Bye bye.